Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. In the previous session, we were uh, completing the tawaf prayer behind Maqam Ibrahim and the drinking of Zamzam. And um, following that, the next major element of both Umrah and Hajj is that of Sa'i. And Sa'i literally means to run or to walk or to make an effort. The Arabic is used in different contexts. But from the Islamic perspective, it is that walk or trot in different parts between Mounts Safa and Marwa. And this act again is a commemoration of Hagar's struggle, what she had to go through. Left there in the valley of Mecca, without water, trying to find a caravan by going to the top of Safa, looking to see if there are any caravans coming, or following that, running to Marwa and looking there in all directions, and after giving up, after not finding what she sought, Allah caused the well of Zamzam to begin as a spring near the feet of Prophet Ismail. As we said, this is a reminder of Allah's promise of a way out for those who trust in him, that after difficulty, no matter how difficult things might be, there will come a time of ease in the Ma'al Usri Yusra. And these are the concepts that we should keep in mind while performing these acts because they have relevance in our own lives. And as we reflect on what it meant to Hagar, Hajar, we should reflect on what it means to ourselves. How many times in life when the difficulty came, we gave up, we took the wrong course, and then later we saw there was another way. But we weren't patient enough to benefit from that way. So the Hajj has in it a point of reflection and contemplation where we look over our own lives and see where the weaknesses lay and take from the acts of Hajj guidance in how to be patient, how to trust in Allah, and Allah willing, what Hajar faced and what she received, we can also receive as we will face. Now, the Sa'i, as I mentioned, is in commemoration of her search. And in terms of the Umrah, 
This basically is the last rite of the Umrah. Following it is the shaving or halq. That's the last rite which closes the Umrah. And the shaving, of course, it's shaving or trimming. Uh, most men like to trim. And the less they trim, the better. However, the Prophet ﷺ had said, blessed are those who shave. And in his time, no different from our time, some of the Sahaba asked, what about those who trim? And he said, blessed are those who shave. They still repeated, but what about those who trim, O Messenger of Allah? So in the end, he said, yeah, okay. They're also blessed. But he stressed where we should be. We should be about shaving. Because shaving is connected to ihram. As we humbled ourselves in ihram, the shaving is more humbling than trimming. You know, especially when people go about trimming, you know, they say, well, okay, what is the minimum that we can trim? They say, well, at least you take so many hairs from, so they, okay, they lightly over their head, you know. Not really a trim. You would never go to a barber and pay for that. You wouldn't call it a trim. But when you're making Hajj and Umrah, that's what you call a trim. You don't want any more than that. Uh, you see, this is saying that what we were trying to humble, what we were trying to subdue, we still haven't subdued. It's still there. Its ugly head is still sticking up. <laughs> That's the bottom line, you know. So for those of you that are planning to make Hajj, shave. Don't hesitate. Go ahead and shave. Some people say, well, okay, you know, we, we still have this, the Umrah, so, you know, if we shave now, then there won't be anything left to shave again, because we still have to do it at the end of the Hajj. But it's okay. If it were an issue, then the Prophet ﷺ would have said, trim now, shave later. But he said, shave now and shave later. Because yes, after three days, you know, uh, from that point, actually, depending on how or when you did your, your Umrah, because the Umrah could have been done way earlier, you will have enough hair, hair on your head that a shave is a full shave. But even if it were that you did that Umrah on the 8th or the 7th, or you just came in on the same day of the 8th, you know, you're still looking at uh, going through from the 8th all the way to the 13th. That's a good another five days. You'll have hair on your head. Won't be much. But still, it's enough for a shave. It's a shave. So, you know, let us not defeat the goal of Hajj. It's to lower ourselves for the sake of Allah. You know, as the Prophet ﷺ had said, مَن تَوَضَعَ لِلَّهِ رَفَعَ Whoever humbles himself, lowers himself for the sake of Allah, Allah will raise him or her. That's the promise of the Prophet ﷺ. So we have to know and we have to believe that this is a good thing. And for the women, of course, the trimming is the, the norm that they trim and they gather, they can gather the hair together and trim at the end of you know, one lock or whatever, or if they have 
to get the hair from to both sides and trim at the end of it. You know, they make one inch, whatever they, but there's not actually a set amount. The Prophet ﷺ didn't set an amount. So for you as a woman, whatever will humble you, do it. Of course, in some cultures, because for, you know, I know some Indian, Pakistani type cultures, areas, a woman isn't supposed to trim her hair. You know, it's considered like a no-no. This is like bad. Don't do it. Don't cut your hair. But actually, Islam has no, no rule like that, that women should not cut their hair. It's just for the Umrah, the Hajj, they were not uh, told to shave their heads. It was, they were told to trim. Okay? But we can't extrapolate from that and say that they shouldn't otherwise. No, it's, it's perfectly okay. So what trimming on your head, when you look at yourself, you feel humbled, what will cause you to achieve that, then do it. So this may vary from woman to woman, person to person. So that closes basically the, the rights of Umrah. And some of them are repeated again in the Hajj. The Sa'i will do again. The Shaving will do again. Tawaf will do again. So, for the Hajj, the next major act is that of the time spent in Mina. Mostly people look at Mina as being like transit. You know, it's not really considered as something you have to take care of. Like Mina is like, you know, the Umrah. You know, Mina is just on the way to Arafah. On the way back from Arafah. That's how it's looked at. But in reality, we spend more time in Mina than anywhere else in the Hajj. That is the reality. You have the eighth, right? Then the morning of the ninth, midday of the ninth, you go out to Arafah. Night, Muzdalifa. Then you're back on the tenth to Mina. You stay in the Mina on the tenth and the eleventh and the twelfth and the thirteenth. Or it could go on the 12th, okay? So what you're talking about is five days in Mina. Where else in Hajj do we spend more time? No place. So if Allah has prescribed four or five days in Mina, then surely it must be important. Wouldn't you agree? It must be important. But that's not how it's treated. Traditionally, it's just a place that you transit. You may rest your head for a minute, you know. And how people treat Mina, it's, you know, it's like a free-for-all. You just get into Mina, you're roaming around, looking, seeing, you know, going to bake and buying some, you know, fried chicken or, you know, this is just a hangout spot on the way to Arafah. But reality is that Mina is critical for the rest of the Hajj. Most time spent in Mina. So it means that we have to look after Mina properly, carefully. Especially with this mentality of it just being transit. And that is for most people who make Hajj. So they blow Mina. 
Mina is blown. Very little reward comes out of Mina. Mostly we are complaining about the toilets, about the food, about the garbage. So that's, we just end up spending our time either complaining about these things or we're chatting with each other, you know, socializing. Mostly it's roaming the streets of Mina. But that's not what Mina was for. Mina actually is for preparing first and foremost because we have Mina before Arafah and we have Mina after Arafah. So there are two phases of Mina. Now Mina before Arafah, I, and, and the, the eighth day, I should just mention, of Dhul Hijjah, when we set out to Mina, it's called Yawm al Tarwiyah, or the watering day. In case you came across this and were wondering why is it called the watering day. Because those who are going by camel or horse or donkey or whatever, they would water their animals there in Mecca, you know, before setting out. Mina, they're setting out to Mina and they will prepare the animals for Arafah, going on to Arafah. So they called it Yawm al Tarwiyah. The Sunnah practice of the Prophet in Mina was not to pray Sunnah prayers. The usual Sunnah prayers that we pray before and after our Fard prayers. The Prophet ﷺ reduced those prayers as traveler, as a traveler, he reduced them. All those which are four rakat, he reduced them to two. Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha were reduced to two units of prayer. And this is what we do as a traveler. And this is enshrined here in the Hajj. And it's important here that we note this because in the practice of shortening prayers when traveling, you have a lot of people who say, why are you shortening your prayers? You know? In those days, when travel was difficult, etc., this is what the shortening of prayers were for. Now, it's easy. Traveling is easy. We have cars, buses, planes, trains. Why do you need to shorten your prayers? We don't need to get into that. The Prophet ﷺ made it a part of Hajj to shorten our prayers. It is a concession which Allah has given us. And as the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah doesn't like that our, his concessions are not taken. You know, Allah says, take it easy, do two. You say, ah, don't need to do two, I can do four. You know, it doesn't sound right, does it? Allah gave you two, take it. Take it and know that doing two is worth more than doing four. People say, how? How? Four rak'ah surely must be better than two. Isn't it? Logically, we say four rak'ah, you're doing four, it should be worth more than two. But it's not. In this case, there's more reward in doing two than in doing four. 
because two is a concession from Allah. You are taking that gift from Allah, you're accepting it, and you are following the sunnah of Rasulullah by doing it, it's worth more. That's the reality. And that is the greatness of Allah. That he can make two worth more than four. So, in this time, we shorten our prayers, but we don't join them. We don't join them. Now, normally we look at joining, shortening and joining as a combined thing for those who are travelers. But really, actually, the, the joining of prayers is not specific to the traveler. It is permissible even for the resident to join prayers when they find a need. There's a lot of people who are not aware of this. That you can join your prayers when you find a need. You can bring your dhuhr to asr, or you can bring your asr and pray it after your dhuhr. You can delay your maghrib to isha, or bring your isha forward and pray it after, immediately after praying your maghrib. Where you find a need, due to your life circumstances, because I'm sure there are times when you found yourself where you couldn't pray Asr in time. So you end up praying it in Maghrib time. And that, of course, is missed prayer. You're making it up, but it's really not Qada. You've missed the prayer deliberately. Then it's a missed prayer. Whereas if you join it with your dhuhr, because you knew in the time of dhuhr you're going to run into this problem, then you have prayed ada, a prayer in its acceptable time. So when you find yourself in that kind of a situation, you know you're not going to be able to pray your maghrib on time, you make the intention and join it with your Isha. Don't go into that time of Maghrib and then you know you can't, so you delay it, you delay it, you delay it until Isha comes and then you pray it. But you make the intention ahead so it is something you have already planned. Because if you miss a prayer and then say, okay, okay, I'll just join it. You, you missed it. Done. You should make the intention. So, but in the case of Mina here, the joining, the Prophet ﷺ did not join, and in not doing so, basically, he's telling us not to do it. Because he told us, Khudu anni manasikakum, take your rights of Hajj and Umrah from me. Do as I did. So if that's what he did, we need to do that. When there are other options, he gave those options. Like on the 10th, when people were asked him, um, we stoned first, then we uh, went to Mecca, then we slaughtered, or we slaughtered first, then we stoned. He, they, uh, he said, no problem, no problem, no problem. The order was not the issue. So where there is flexibility, he made it clear. It was made clear. So he didn't join the prayers there in Mina. He shortened them. And in doing so, shortening them there in Mina, the basic Rites of Mina are the formal prayers, supplications, and the words of remembrance, adhkar. That's the focus 
of Mina, before Arafah, as well as after. But before Arafah in particular, this is where we are, it is important to pray those formal prayers on time, praying Salatul Fajr there on time, because what happens is that people there, because they're taking this as a transit and looking at it very laxly, they'll end up missing Fajr, praying it late after sunrise, and then the rest of the day is just a mess. Prayers are here, there, everywhere. Maybe that's the way we do it back home anyway. We just brought it with us to Hajj. But this is the time now to put things in order. This is the time when we need to pray Fajr on time, in its time. So we set the pattern for the rest of our Hajj. And supplications, this is now the time for individual supplication. Because you have time. It's a, it's a, we have to really manage the time that Allah has given us there in Mina. Use the time well. We're going to Arafah. Arafah, basically, if we enter Arafah on time, we will be supplicating for close to six hours. Has anybody supplicated for six hours here before? It's something we've never done in our lifetime. You know, we've been in congregations, whatever, where people supplicated for a while after prayers and things like this. But imagine now supplicating for six hours. We hardly find time after our formal prayers to supplicate. Right now, right? Give it a few minutes even. Imagine six hours of supplication. So Mina is the place where we start to prepare ourselves for Arafah. Because remember at the beginning we said, the Prophet ﷺ said what? Al-Hajju Arafah. That's the core of Hajj. It's Arafah. And Arafah is six hours of supplication. So if we're not ready for six hours of supplication, then our Hajj wasn't Arafah. That's the bottom line. Arafah, we're going to run into problems. Because that's all that Arafah is about. Supplication. We have been so used to praying with the Imam, after the prayers, the Imam makes his dua, Rabbana, Amin, 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 Amin. That's the extent of our supplication. Just Amin, Amin, Amin. We don't know what the Imam is saying, but we just Amin, Amin. Now, what happens in Arafah? We're in trouble. We're in big trouble. So, Arafah will not be what it is supposed to be. So Mina basically is like the preparation for Arafah. Mina before Arafah is preparation. This is really what the essence of Mina is about. It's preparation for Arafah. If we are treating it like transit, Arafah will be a calamity. Arafah will be a calamity. We'll end up spending our time trying to climb on top of Mount Rahma. You know, we'll be scrambling here, scrambling there. Okay, let's go up Mount Rahma, you know, stumbling, climbing. So we get caught up with trying to get to the top of Mount Rahma, which is not what Arafah was about at all. Prophet Muhammad didn't stand there. He didn't go to the top of, you know, Mount Rahma and make and supplicate. He didn't. But for most people who end up there, that's what they, they're looking. Where is, 
Mount Rahma. And they will go walking, setting off in Arafah. They'll spend hours walking to Mount Rahma and then climbing on the top. They make a couple of du'as and they're back down and walking back to their camp again. So Arafah, which was supposed to be six hours of supplication, gone. Our Hajj wasn't Arafah. So this is how important Mina is. Mina now is our preparation. Just as wudu before salah, we have Mina before Arafah. It is the necessary preliminary. So therefore, in Mina, we need to work on our dua, our supplication. Consciously knowing that we have ahead of us six hours in Arafah. So my advice is, for those of you going this year still, my advice is, you start to make a list of du'as. Even actually if you're planning to go next year, or you're still here, you're, you're going to go tomorrow, day after, whatever. Even from now. Start writing down the important du'as that you can make for yourself, for your family, etc. Because there, you will quickly run out. If you just leave it to yourself as you are right now, imagine if I asked you to make six hours of du'a now, you would be finished in two minutes, you can't think of anything else. What else can I ask for? What else can I seek forgiveness for? You know. So it's something we have to prepare ourselves for because we haven't done it before. And in the same way as we know wudu should be done properly before our salah, then the same way, Mina should be treated. If our prayers are done properly, our du'as are done with full contemplation, sincerely, then inshallah, Arafah will be successful for us. And since the main goal of Hajj is salvation from sin, then we should all learn Sayyidul Istighfar. Prophet Muhammad taught us a dua which he called Sayyidul Istighfar. Sayyid means like the leader, the master. It is the best way to seek forgiveness from Allah. So, if you don't know it, then learn it from now before you go for the Hajj. Also, though as we said, the Sunnah prayers are not done. We have shortened our prayers. We're not going to do the Sunnahs before and after the compulsory prayers. Except for the two before Fajr. Witter and tahajjud should be done. Something again, which we, in our regular lives, we're not doing. Most of us don't make it. We hear about it. We know it's good, but somehow we don't manage to do it. There in Mina, we want to do it. We want to Make sure that we are up at night for tahajjud and make that witter. Prophet Muhammad had told us that, you know, in case of tahajjud, it's the best prayer. After the obligatory prayer, it is the greatest of prayers. Why? Because it is the freest from riyah. At night, nobody else knows, it's just you and Allah. The regular prayers, everybody else can see you. You know, the element of Riyah is there, buzzing around 
touches us at different times, in different ways. But tahajjud, it's just you and Allah. So, in Mina, make sure that you establish the tahajjud. Because as we said, Mina is preparation for Arafah. Arafah is supplication. The essence of Arafah is supplication. We spend the time supplicating. Therefore, it is important for us to ensure that we are in fact prepared for Arafah. And the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, in which he talked about the last third of the night, that's the time of tahajjud, where Allah guarantees forgiveness for those who supplicate to him, call on him at that time. In terms of the rites of Mina, after Arafah, well, they include our formal prayers, but included along with them is the stoning of the Jamrat, and that's done in Mina. And in between that time, between the 10th and the 13th in Mina, we do go and make Tawaf al Ifada, we do slaughter animals. But in general, in terms of Mina, we will have a lot of time on our hands. As I said, people treat it as transit but it's actually time wasted if we treat it that way. And the Prophet Sallallahu had warned us about spare time. He said there are two blessings about which most people are deceived. Good health and spare time. As-sihhatu wal-faragh. Spare time. But Allah told us, in Surah Al-Inshirah, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ If you find spare time from your worship, then you should worship in other ways. Continue to worship. Worship should really have no end. Because the strive that the Muslim is supposed to make is to turn his or her complete life into worship. So that whatever we're doing is worship. So this is what Allah is talking about. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ If you have finished from your formal prayers or the prescribed prayers at that particular time, then don't abandon worship. But look to turn whatever other acts that you are about to engage in, to turn them also into worship, so that they can become a form of prayer also. So in Mina, we should be conscious of praising Allah, the adhkar. If we don't know them, the adhkar of the morning and the evening, we should learn them before we go, print them out, whatever, take them with us, and utilize them. Because in that space, the time we said, you want to be engaged with some different forms of supplication. Because even the adhkar, when we mention the names of Allah, or we mention phrases uh, wherein we are calling on Allah in one way or another, these are du'as. 
They're just another form of supplication. So we should learn all of the recommended ones in a day. There was a book which was done by Ahmed von Denfer called A Day in the Life of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A Day in the Life of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In which he basically mentioned, you know, the different adhkar that the Prophet Sallallahu made from the time he got up in the morning till the time he went to, to bed at night. So it becomes a nice guide for the various supplications that we should be utilizing on a daily basis. So if you can get a hold of that book, maybe you can go online, it's available, you can download it, whatever. Um, collect it. Or Fortress of a Muslim, this is one of the best compilations of various supplications that the Prophet ﷺ taught. Fortress of a Muslim, Husnul Muslim. Uh, it's available with English translation. I'm sure it's probably in Urdu also, Urdu translation and other languages. So take it with you if you haven't learned those du'as and utilize it. So they're in Mina. Also, there is room for some socialization. You know, it's not to say that you can't talk to anybody around you and you know, you're in a circumstance here now where there is time and you have people who have come with you on Hajj who you've never met before, new people, etc. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did socialize for da'wah purposes during the Hajj. He used to go to the different areas where the different clans and tribes were set up and he would talk to them about Allah, etc. So at that time, it's also an opportunity to socialize, but in a limited sense, and also reminding those around you about the importance and the seriousness of Mina. So you're reminding them of Allah, you're engaged in Dawah. Let that be the goal, not just merely getting to know those that you made Hajj with. Right? The goal ultimately is to encourage them to be aware of what is the purpose of Mina, its goals. And in reminding them, you're reminding yourself. And the package in which you are doing it is one in which you are socializing. So it's socializing with a purpose. What you don't want to be doing, what you need to avoid, is unnecessary talk. Talk which doesn't serve any purpose. It's just wasting time. For the most part, it ends up being backbiting or boasting, you know, talking useless talk, vain talk. This is the time when you need to be as careful as possible. This is precious time. We want to look after it and protect it. And then roaming around the grounds of Mina. Again, going out for what is necessary to get some fruit or to get some food or whatever. No harm, etc. Um, taking a walk because of course just sitting in the tent the whole time you know it's good to at least from an exercise point of view to go take a walk you know but again doing it with the humility that we have gained from Hajj up until that point you know the Umrah, which we did, all of the lessons of humility, we apply them at that time. So, we are preparing for Arafah. 
Arafah is on the 9th. Of course, for those of us that are here, this is a recommended day for fasting, which has as a reward two years of salvation from sin. As the Prophet Sallallahu had said, one who fasts on the day of Arafah, the sins of the previous year and the current year are for forgiven. So, for those of us not going for Hajj, let's not miss this special opportunity. <clears throat> but for those of us there who will be there, then we will go into Arafah by midday. That is the preferable time. Some people go in earlier. It's possible. But Arafah per se is counted between Dhuhr and Maghrib. Between Dhuhr and Maghrib. So between Dhuhr and Maghrib, we have Salat al-Dhuhr and Salat al-Asr. In this case, there is a masjid there, a large masjid there, or any masjid that uh, is nearby or place where people, musalla, where people are praying, you may pray your Dhuhr and Asr, shortened and joined. There you join it. You're joining the prayers now so that you leave the maximum time for continued supplication because Hajj is Arafah. Hajj is Arafah. So we should strive to maximize Arafah, to pray as we have never prayed before, And to do so, we need to prepare ourselves from now, start preparing ourselves from now, through the Umrah, till Mina, and be ready for 